Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest webcast in Caring.com's Digital Marketing Academy. Our session today is about using social media conversations to glean marketing and content insights and better understand your senior care customers and prospects. I'm Denise Grubb, a marketing director here at Caring.com, and our featured expert today is Jason Falls of the Conversation Research Institute, who we will introduce further momentarily. Uh, just bear with me one moment while I advance the slide. There we go. Um, before we get started, though, I want to let you know this is a one-way webcast where only the presenters speak. However, you can definitely ask questions. We want you to ask questions. You'll see in the upper right of your screen is a box. You can enter your questions either during the session or toward the end when we do a Q&A. And uh, any questions that don't get answered during the session, we'll follow up with you afterward to make sure you get a response to your question. Uh, this is also a common question we get, and that is, are, you, are we going to share the slides afterward? The answer is yes. We will share these present mat presentation materials with you afterward. We are also recording this session. And while this session is free of charge, you do have to listen to this brief commercial for Caring.com as your price of admission. Uh, we have 3 million visitors using our site Senior Care Resources every month. These are families and older adults who are turning to us for caregiving information, referral, and support. They also come to us for reviews about senior care providers, including senior living communities, in-home care agencies, hospice, geriatric care managers. Uh, in fact, we are the largest senior care review site with about 150,000 consumer reviews on our website today, and we add thousands every month. Uh, we also have thousands of original articles across all caregiving and elder care topics, and we host dozens of online support groups and enable family caregivers to create their own online support groups on our website. We're owned by Bankrate, and we're part of a powerful network of websites dedicated to supporting people and making complex financial decisions. Today's webinar was presented in collaboration with SMASH Senior Care Marketing Sales Summit happening in Chicago in October, and we'll tell you more about that toward the end of the session. We worked closely with SMASH Managing Director Bailey Beacon in planning this session, and we also worked with SMASH Conference Program Producer Regina D'Alessio, who is here to introduce our guest expert. So let me unmute Regina so she can introduce our guest. Okay, Regina, uh, the mic is on for you. Thank you so much, Denise, and uh, I'm delighted to be here as part of the SMASH team and uh, to, uh, have the privilege to introduce today's featured speaker, Jason Falls, who's leading today's webinar and will also be a keynote presenter at the SMASH conference. So as author of No BS Social Media, The Business No Hype Guide to Social Media Marketing, and with over 100,000 Twitter followers, Jason is one of the most widely read and respected voices in the digital marketing and social media industries. He spends much of his time analyzing online conversations for consumer insights for his clients of the Conversation Research Institute, and also consulting on broad digital marketing issues for a number of B2C and B2B clients. His company's most recent industry report is focused on the senior care space, and he's excited to share this data with us today, as well as at the SMASH conference uh, this October. So Denise, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Regina. And, and folks, we'll have Regina back at the end to tell us more about SMASH. Uh, let me advance the slide now. Okay, uh, for those of you not yet familiar with me, I've been here at Caring.com for nearly seven years now, first serving as our Director of Social Community. I helped grow Caring.com's Facebook page from a few hundred to over 60,000 fans or likes as they're called today. Uh, in January 2016, I transitioned to a role uh, helping senior living uh, communities and in-home care partners as Director of Industry Marketing. I have extensive communications experience ranging from journalism and public relations to marketing communications, social marketing, and online community management. 
And uh, I too was an early adopter of social media and have been helping brands with social marketing for about 10 years now. Uh, in fact, I previously attended social media events with Jason Falls as a featured speaker. So I know how great he is at his trade and I'm very excited to be participating in this webinar with him. As usual, we have a lot we're going to cover. Uh, we'll start with explaining, uh, well, Jason will explain for us what social listening is and how this conversation research is done. Then we'll dive into Jason's uh, recent research into conversations about senior care and social media, and we'll wrap up with answering your questions, both those you submitted in advance when you registered, as well as those you submit during the session, and we'll end with the key takeaways and a few special announcements. So please stick around for the end. I know some people jump off after the Q&A, but you're gonna miss some really important announcements. They're gonna save you some money. So definitely stay on at the end. Okay, so uh, Jason, are you ready to get started? With my, uh, I, As I uh, mentioned um, uh, to you before we were planning, that we have a lot of folks participating in today's session that have a wide range of social media experience. Some are newbies, some use it daily. Um, there's even some on this session that have years of experience like you and I. Um, to help ensure that everyone is on the same page before we dive into your insights, let's begin by defining what it is exactly you mean when you reference conversation research or social listening so they understand that better. And then also, um, please describe a bit about how it's done and which specific types of social media you recommend folks use to do this analysis. And I'm going to go ahead and um, give you the mouse of panel. Uh, all right. So now you should have keyboard control. Is that correct? I believe I do. Um, actually, sorry, I need to go back to, um, bear with us folks, I passed the whole presentation rather than the mouse. There we go. Now you have the mouse. Sorry about that. Okay, very good. Um, well, hello everyone and, and thank you for attending today's call. We are going to go over some pretty interesting things here and as Denise was saying, I know there's a lot of, we were talking earlier, I know there's a, a lot of different people on the call with a lot of different levels of experience. Uh, in the social media space. The good news is, is conversation research doesn't necessarily require you to have a great understanding of social media. If you know anything about uh, research at all, market research, uh, or are just simply interested in your consumers, then you'll be able to kind of follow along and understand. I'm going to touch on some uh, aspects of social media so those who are very experienced in the digital marketing space, particularly in social media, will get a lot out of this as well. But what conversation research is, is actually leveraging the, the tools that are available to conduct market research uh, on conversations on the social web. And so to kind of start, what is conversation research and, and sort of dive into that a little bit. It's, essentially, there exists uh, in, in the world today technology platforms called social listening platforms. They used to be called social media monitoring platforms, but all of the different companies have sort of changed their, their terminology. Some of them are even starting to call themselves social media analytics platforms, but it doesn't matter what name they choose to describe themselves. Essentially what these software platforms do is just like Google, you start with them and you type in a keyword or a keyword phrase and it goes out on the public web uh, and I'll go over all the different networks that it hits because it basically hits anything that's public um, and there's some stipulations you need to understand about that. But it goes out to any public conversation, any website out there where there is information that can be read by a, a search engine or a spider for one of these services that's kind of crawling through and indexing the pages. And it brings all of the relevant results back to you just like a search engine does. But the difference in a search engine and the social listening platforms is those social listening platforms do a very good job of sort of quantifying what's out there. How many results there are that mention that particular word or phrase, what different networks they come from, in some instances where it can tell if the user is a male or a female and what state or geography they're from, etc. It can give you demographics. So it can tell you here is where people are talking about this particular word or phrase or topic. 
And then here's what we know about them from understanding either their profile information on those networks uh, or information about those users that the site provides to us uh, for, for free or as part of, of, of our indexing of that particular site. And so it works a lot like a search engine, but it's much more advanced so that you can really understand what the conversation is. So the type of social media that these search engines, these social listening platforms go out and find includes anything, as I said, that's in the public space. So if a website has uh, uh, a forum or a message board, if it has blogs and comment sections on the blogs, uh, if it's a social network where there are users who log in and participate and have conversation or post things, and the website is has you know sort of code behind it as part of their user agreement and whatnot that says we can make your content public, then the social listening platform can index that site. A good example is Twitter. Twitter by default is mostly public information. In order to turn your Twitter account to private, you actually have to tell it, hey, I don't want people to see my posts. Um, it kind of defeats the purpose of being on Twitter because Twitter is kind of intended to be an open public network. So the majority of Twitter users allow their content and what they post on Twitter to be read and be indexed publicly. So we can find the majority of Twitter conversations. Obviously, we cannot index that which those users that say, I want my posts to be private just for my friends, but that's not very many people when you look at the grand scheme of things on Twitter. Facebook is just the opposite. Facebook, by default, uh, and as a policy says, we will not let you index or read individual users' posts. What Facebook will let us read, though, is anything that happens on a brand page or anything that happens on a public group page. So anything that you post uh, on your news feed to your friends, I can't see if I'm analyzing it with these softwares. But if you post something on a brand page or on a group that is public, then we can pull that in. What I can tell you about that, just real quickly to touch on it, is the lion's share of online conversations today happen on Facebook and the lion's share of those conversations. Jay? Yes? Can you repeat that? Uh, you broke off. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the, the lion's share of conversations today online happen on Facebook. Um, and, and unfortunately, because Facebook's privacy policy says you can't see a personal uh, profile's posts, we're not able to index the lion's share of the conversations that are out there. But there are certain parts of Facebook that are available and the greater social web blogs, comments, forums, message boards, even uh, the comment sections of sites like YouTube and newspaper websites. All of those conversation platforms are sort of fair game for us to index and analyze. So when, when you ask the question, which type of social media do you focus on for this type of analysis, Depending upon what we're doing, we can focus on a very specific network, but in general, we focus on anything we can find where people are talking about your brand or the topic in question. So the way the research and analysis is done, and I'll take you through a few slides here that kind of give you a, an understanding of, of the context of this. Um, we essentially go out and, for instance, for this particular research that I'm going to share with you today, um, we went out and found all of the uh, conversations over the course of a one-year period, so this is a year's worth of data, where people were mentioning or talking about senior care and senior living within the contexts of the types of facilities that uh, are, are chosen in the senior care, senior living space. So we looked for people mentioning nursing homes, assisted living facilities, independent living facilities, hospice care, rehabilitation centers, um, long-term care facilities. We went out and collected all of these conversations and counted them, and then we went through and filtered out anything that we determined was not the voice of the consumer. So that's how we got to this research. You can look at, at 
different research projects in very different ways. So if someone came to me and said, I really only care what people are saying in this one particular form or message board, so I'm going to zone in or zoom in rather on that particular website, and I really only want uh, to, to know what people are saying about cafeteria food, for instance. So we can actually zero in and get really granular, but in this particular case we wanted to understand what anybody said about the senior care and senior living space when they were sort of in the consideration set of trying to uh, select a facility for a loved one. So we'll get a little bit more into that in a second, but I want to take you through a couple of slides to sort of show you um, how conversation research uh, is similar and different from research you may have seen before. And I'm trying to figure out where to advance the slide. Here we go. Oops, I need to go back one. Well, I'm having trouble getting back where I need to go. Denise, do you think you can help me go back to the traditional uh, versus uh, conversation slide? For some reason, I'm not seeing my icons. Here we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, so just to give you a quick rundown of, of the differences between traditional market research and conversation research. Traditional research, which is typically focus groups or surveys, is very structured. It's also very directed feedback, so you're standing there with a clipboard asking very specific questions of your audience, or you're writing very specific questions for them to answer in, for instance, an online or a phone survey. So you're asking them questions, and they know they're being asked those questions, so there is a subject bias there. In order to get someone to participate in market research these days, you typically have to incent them somehow, which that alone is a bias. You're not getting a true representative sample. You're getting a representative sample of people that are gullible or susceptible enough to participate in your survey for the incentive that you're offering. It can also be very time consuming and costly. Um, I implemented a national um, uh, telephone survey uh, for a client about two years ago. Uh, it was about 50 questions um, and it took about 20 minutes to complete. Um, and there was obviously lots of preparation that went into writing the questions, etc. Uh, and then we had to get a representative sample of the United States, so we ended up having to survey roughly 2,000 people to get the, the right amount of data that we needed so that it could be weighted and balanced. That survey with a reputable uh, a market research firm cost about $30,000. So market research in the traditional, traditional sense is not exactly um, uh, cost effective for most organizations. Conversation research on the other hand, the, the drawback to conversation research is at the top of the, this list. It's unstructured. So I have to go out and find every mention of let's say assisted living facilities and that might be mentions in press releases. It might be mentions in news stories that aren't necessarily the voice of the consumer. So I have to spend a lot of time and use technology to isolate the conversations that matter. I also have to add some human analysis to it to make sure the computers aren't making mistakes. But what I'm getting back is a lot more data and it's unsolicited feedback. So it's a virtual fly on the wall experience you're listening and eavesdropping into people having natural conversations, not being prompted to tell you something. So there's less bias. There's certainly bias in every conversation, but there's less bias in understanding uh, the conversation that's going on because you as the researcher are not necessarily participating in the conversation. It can be real or near real time. Certainly the more time you take to analyze it, the more insights you can get out of it, but you can set up an automated search in one of these software platforms that can alert you as every time someone mentions your brand name, every time someone says a certain keyword phrase, and so you can actually glean insights as they happen in some circumstances, and it can be much more cost efficient. Now the software itself, especially the software um, that is sophisticated enough to help you really gl glean consumer insights is, is going to cost you a couple of thousand dollars a month or more as a subscription. But when you're talking about investing twenty four to let's say $40,000 a year in a software platform as a 
that you can use every day as opposed to a one-time research project that costs almost as much, if not more, that is a snapshot in time, you can start to see some cost efficiencies. The good news is, is there's also firms like mine, the Conversation Research Institute, where you don't have to subscribe to the software. You can just come in and say, I want to do a project, and the cost efficiencies then come to, to bear on your project at that time. So what do we use research for? Well, research typically, traditional market research, is typically used to understand more about what your audience thinks about the product that you have, the experience that the customer has with that product or service or company, or the messaging or targeting uh, that you can do. So it can help you improve your, your marketing message, your talking points, understand how your audience is responding to them. It can help you understand more about how your audience feels about interacting with you, and it certainly can help you get ideas and insights about how they use the product. Um, what type of, of use cases they have for it, so on and so forth. Conversation research is no different. We use it for the same exact thing. Again, we're looking at unstructured data. There's a lot of it out there, but the software helps us get closer to where we need to be in understanding insights about the product, the experience, or the messaging. Our approach at the Conversation Research Institute and the way we, we found the data that we're going to show you here in just a second is we start asking questions. Now we are not, uh, the, the CRI is not in the senior care or the senior living space. We are a digital marketing uh, think tank and social media conversation research consultancy. So we start out asking a lot of questions. In fact, we did two focus groups to get into this research. One focus group was a, a panel of about a dozen industry executives so that we can understand how does the senior living space, how do executives, how does the industry talk about itself, what type of products do you offer, how do you refer to them, what vermin, uh, terminology and verbiage do you use, um, what, who is your target consumer, who are you typically going after. So we did a panel, uh, a focus group uh, of phone conversations with people in the industry to understand that perspective. Then we did another panel of people who had actually subscribed to, enrolled, or purchased senior living care for a relative in the previous year. So recent customers, because we wanted to ask the same questions of them. What products did you go looking for? What type of terminology do you use when you're talking about um, you know, trying to select a facility for a loved one or yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So we had both perspectives, and then we started to ask questions like, okay, what are the problems does the industry face? Um, what is the experience like for new customers? How do they find their information? Once we have a really good understanding of what the opportunities are, the problems in the industry, and the terminology, we actually set about trying to collect conversations where people are talking about these topics and things. Once we collect all that data, we do something called disambiguation, which is where we go in and make sure that we're getting rid of not things that are not the voice of the consumer. So if it's a news article or a press release, that's of little concern to us because that's the media talking about it or a company talking about themselves. That's not the consumer talking about their experience. We also sometimes have to get rid of um, you know, similar terminology. So in this particular research project, we didn't have a lot of that, but for instance, uh, many of you might be familiar with Kindred Healthcare, which is headquartered here in Louisville, Kentucky, is a healthcare organization that plays in this space a bit. Well, if I go looking for posts about Kindred Healthcare, I'm liable to also find people talking about uh, that they are a kindred spirit with someone else, or uh, the word kindred just being used in the conversation. So we have to go through and weed out those references to the words we're using that aren't necessarily relevant. After we do that and are comfortable that we have a data set that is the voice of the consumer, then we're able to explore it, ask questions about the data, see what insights it reveals, and then we're able to really kind of think about it and compare it to what we know uh, to see if it uh, sheds light on anything we might uh, not know or not expect to find in the data. So that's kind of a, a really quick look at how we approach uh, this research. We try very hard to sort of follow um, Aristotelian logic and, and try to um, you know, be very scientific and document every step of the way so that if we're ever questioned for it, we can uh, make sure that people understand that our research is defensible and we can uh, explain how we reach those conclusions. So for this particular report, go ahead. 
Oh, yeah. I just wanted to um, thank you for laying that groundwork and explaining uh, how your group does the research uh, and how others can model after that and what's out there for them. So thank you very much for that. And I'm sure, and you, you've talked about it a little bit, but I'm sure the folks on the call are really looking forward to hearing exactly what you learned from the study you did mm -hmm. and um, how you specifically went into that study and the specific findings from it. Absolutely. So that's where we are now. So when we sat down to do this report, we took, you know, basically the methodology that I've sort of explained. We learned a lot from, we tried to learn the industry terminology. We did a lot of, of sort of front end reading and research, not necessarily looking at the data, but uh, going out and reading, uh, you know, industry articles, having conversations with people in the industry to get to know the industry better. Um, we then had our industry executive focus group where we asked those questions about the target audience, et cetera, that I've already explained. We talked to the recent purchasers to understand their experience. Then we sat about collecting the data, and the way we went about it with this report was we listed all of the possible uh, facility types in the industry, everything from nursing homes to assisted living facilities to rehabbed hospice, rehabilitation hospitals, so on and so forth. And we went out there and searched for mentions of those facility types because what we found is in nearly every conversation, especially with consumers, we were hearing things like, we were hearing the names of the facilities first. I have to put my mother in a nursing home or I'm choosing between an assisted living and an independent care facility. The facility type was something that was very important uh, in the conversation, so we felt like that would be the easiest path to get to these conversations. We then went through and weeded out anything that wasn't the voice of the consumer, and then we went through with human beings and methodically rated, scored, and coded the conversation so that every single post that we actually put in the data set that we analyzed was read by and, and qualified, scored, and graded by a human being so that we weren't just relying on the computer to make assumptions based on the terminology that, terminology that was used. Once we did all that, we you know analyzed this for insights, um, and we looked in all of these different places, blogs, comment sections of blogs and news sites, Twitter, Facebook, and I, the asterisk there on Facebook is what I've explained earlier about the fact that if you type something on your personal Facebook page or profile, we're not going to see that, which is where, again, the majority of online conversations happen these days. But if you post it on a brand page or some other public group or something like that, we can find it. Instagram and photo sites were included, YouTube and video sites, forums and message boards, any online review sites. Your website was included. If you have comment sections or there's areas where the public can ask questions on your website, we went to your website. If it's publicly indexable, then it was included in our data set. So we went out there and collected uh, all this information. So what we found was this, and this is kind of the first big insight that stuck out to us about these conversations. Despite the fact that we cast a wide net and looked for uh, lots of different facilities, really four stood out as being having any sort of volume in the conversation. Out of the total amount of posts that we indexed, which was just under 1,200 after we weeded out all of the things that were not the voice of the consumer, you can see here that two-thirds of the conversation was focused on nursing homes. Now, I want to qualify that a little bit because here's where the insight comes. It's not that these 66% of the conversations were specifically and accurately about nursing homes. We actually went in and analyzed many of them and found that people were saying nursing home, but they were actually referring to some other type of facility. They were referring to assisted living or they were referring to long-term care or independent living or hospice or some other type of care. But the consumer, when they talk about the senior care space, when they are discussing the fact that they are trying to find a facility, that they've enrolled someone in a facility, or that they're dealing with a facility, they refer to many facilities as just one lump term, which is nursing home. So there's really not a distinction in the consumer conversation between an assisted living or an independent living facility, which we all know to be very different from nursing homes 
and the mind of the consumer, for them, it's all a nursing home. The most common phrase that we found in people talking about this issue was, I have to put my mom in a home, or I have to put my dad in a home. And I actually had um, a gentleman uh, at a talk recently came up to me and said, hey, I work in the senior living space, and I just want to take exception to one of the terms you you used over and over again. You kept saying, put mom in a home. We don't refer to it that way. We refer to it as selecting a care facility. And I said, that's right, but I'm not repeating what you said. I'm repeating what your customers are saying. Your customers are saying they have to put mom in a home, and you need to understand that you can put a, a gloss of, you know, a, a put a, a, a coat of paint on what's happening here all you want. You can spin it however you want, but your customers don't say that. They don't say they're selecting a care facility. They say, I'm putting mom in a home, and that's important for you to understand. So the insights that you can pull out of something like this, and this is a broad you know, analysis, but as we got into it and started looking at why people were saying nursing home when they maybe didn't mean that, what that sort of tells me as a marketer is we're not doing a great job as an industry of distinguishing our products and making sure that the consumer marketplace understands that there is a difference in these facilities. We've been trying to do it for a couple of decades now, but I don't think we've done a good enough job to distinguish the difference between a nursing home facility and other types of care in the minds of the consumers. So. What we did as we were sort of mapping, uh, as we were looking at the conversations, we were really trying to go in this with an intention of mapping the consumer journey. We started out with the hypothesis and the question, when people talk about the senior living space and the senior living experience, are there periods of time when they come to the social web, to conversations online, and share and talk more so than others? And we were able to map these five sort of uh, dots along the buyer journey. The first time that people typically come to the web and talk about senior living is when they realize there's a need. They realize they need to start thinking about um, finding care for a parent or a grandparent. And typically we are talking about uh, an adult child of the patient. It's typically not the patient that's coming to the web and talking about it, it's their children. So they maybe they realize that uh, you know their parents' health is declining and uh, no one at home can really provide the level of care they need. Maybe there's some sort of medical incident that requires that they go out and try to find some level of care. But that's the first time that people really come and mention um, that they are looking at these types of facilities. That makes pretty logical sense. We were able to distinguish that though from the next step in the phase, which is actually selecting a facility. Now they've, they, they are beyond realizing they need it. Now they're really focused on selecting a facility that's going to be right for their parent, their grandparent, or their loved one. The third phase that they typically talk about is when they're in the enrollment phase. They've chosen a facility and now they're trying to move mom or dad in, or they're trying to you know, negotiate with the particular facility that they've chosen to make sure that that transition goes smoothly. Then the fourth phase is really the experience after enrollment, how they get along with the facility, how they uh, communicate with and the experience of their loved one uh, in the facility while they're there. And then the fifth one is sort of this wild card of that we call to change. And that happens when either the patient's health declines or improves and they have to change the type of facility they're in or the type of care they are given. So these are sort of the five different phases of the buyer journey, at least uh, as they're represented when people come to the social web and have conversations. So let's look at sort of what that looks like in terms of uh, the volume of conversation uh, and the percentage of, of, and the types of topics that pop up. The majority of this these buyer journey conversations, and there was more in this data than just buyer journey conversations, but remember as we went in with human eyes and, and sort of scored and graded these conversations, if someone talked about the fact that they were shopping for a facility, we scored it that way and we put a label on it that said, hey, this conversation uh, falls into the shopping for a facility or the selection phase. We also scored conversations as deciding to look for options. So they weren't quite to the selection phase, but they were at the realization phase and they needed to 
go that way. We scored many conversations that they have enrolled their parent or they've enrolled their loved one, so they're now at phase three. There were a few conversations there about changing services as that came into that fifth category. And then there were a few that we de decided to call out as making a decision to enroll, which was in phase one, or we had one conversation that we found was someone had enrolled themselves. And so there was an actual patient out there that was talking about the enrollment process as, as well. The decision to enroll and the enrolled self uh, category uh, we put those in sort of the enrollment phase, the third phase uh, of the process. Um, and as you can see, out of 1,200 conversations, a little under 1,200 conversations in the total conversation set, 106, the most of them, the majority of, of the buying journey conversations were found in the selection phase, the shopping phase, which isn't necessarily abnormal in our experience in looking at under other industries, but you can sort of see the quantity of conversation here. Out of about 1,200 conversations, you're talking about you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to 25 percent of the conversations are about the buyer journey. So somewhere in the neighborhood of just under a fourth of them. Now let's look at what the, how these conversations break down, and for the interest of time and, and for our webinar today, I'm looking exclusively at the conversations about nursing homes. Now obviously we break down in our report, in the research, we break down assisted living, independent living, and long-term care as well, but I wanted to give you an idea of what people are talking about in general by just looking at nursing homes as an example. So there were 786 total conversations we found about nursing homes. Almost half of them were what we called the family experience. So this is typically going to be the child or the children who are making the decision and trying to select the facility. There were some other isolated incidents of grandchildren and brothers and sisters and whatnot talking about something other than shopping for a facility that are included in there too, but the family's experience, and ultimately the family is typically going to be your customer in this particular industry, so that was the lion's share of the conversation. Customer inquiries were 16% of the total conversation about nursing homes. These are people raising their hand and asking questions. The insight that we were able to kind of pull out of this is, is in general, in the industry, when a customer raises their hand on a social network or in a social media site and asks a question about a nursing home, or you can see the different numbers uh, in the other uh, categories of facilities if you have the full research, but it happened in each of them. But when someone raises their hand and asks a question, we found that in general, facilities and senior care executives or marketers do not respond. So you're not ans answering the questions that are being asked in the broad social web. Now you may be answering questions via Twitter or via your uh, Facebook page, uh, but in general we found that most senior care brands are ignoring the customers that are actually proactively asking questions on the internet, which is an opportunity for you and your brand. The patient experience comes in there, so we did have some patients who uh, came and, and posted on uh, social webs and forums and message boards about their experience with nursing homes. They weren't necessarily actively participating in the shopping experience, but they would turn to the social web and talk about the fact that they were in uh, a facility or that they were, you know, enjoying a visit from their family. So there a wide range of things, subtopics, fall into that particular category. Finances, recommendations on, hey, I recommend this facility versus that. The quality of care pops up in the nursing home conversation a bit there, and then you can see some of those other topics. Now, I want to break these down, a couple of these uh, topics down by subtopic, so that you can sort of get a real good understanding of what those conversations are made up from. So this is actually taking those total conversations in nursing homes and cutting them down to negative. This is only the negative conversation. So when someone talked about a nursing home and we de deemed the conversation to be negative, what was the topic? Half of it was family experience. Almost half of it was family experience. The patient experience was a largely negative conversation. Finances were in there. That's a big concern, obviously, for families and patients in this particular world. The quality of care might concern you because when people talk negatively about nursing homes, 
Uh, more than 10% of them are talking about the quality of care, which is the primary product you have to offer. So that's something you may want to look more deeply into, which obviously we do in the research. When you break down the family experience, so now let's just to reset, because I know this can be a little confusing to follow along here, we're looking at conversations that mention nursing homes, which as we explained earlier, might also be referring to some other facilities because the customer doesn't distinguish between facilities well. But we're looking at conversations about nursing homes that were scored negative. And now we're looking very specifically about those negative conversations where it was about the family experience. So the biggest category uh, when a family talks negatively about nursing homes is that they say they prefer an alternative. And it's not, quite frankly, that they prefer assisted living or independent living over nursing homes because, as we sort of explained, they don't make that distinction. distinction. They prefer the alternative of not putting their parent or grandparent or relative in a home or in a facility at all. That's generally what the uh, alternative is that they're referring to in this preference. The second category there is concerning to me. I don't know if it's something that you see, but we found the emotional journey for this particular consumer was rather thick and sordid. Family infighting was a big thing, whether that be the family fighting over who was going to pay for it or whether or not they needed to even put the relative in a facility at all. But it was a big deal in this particular conversation, and that's something worth noting when you're dealing with uh, folks who are trying to select this service. When you look at the positive conversations around nursing home, and not all of them were negative, so let's look at the positive. Now you start to see something change a bit. The family experience is no longer the biggest category here. The biggest category in positive conversations about nursing homes is the patient experience, which might you know, bode well for those types of facilities. You can see the other categories that fall in there too, so there's positive conversation about the family experience, finances, etc. So let's break one of these down and make sure we understand that pretty well as well. So when people are talking about nursing homes and they're talking about them positively, um, breaking down the family experience rather than the patient uh, experience because I wanted to compare apples to apples here for you. The shopping for a facility, 24%, so almost a quarter of the positive nursing home conversation was about shopping for a facility. So they were having a good experience and they were willing to turn around and share that experience with others as they talked about this on the social web. So that bodes well for us if we deliver a good experience. It means that people will turn around and tell others about it online. The burden of care came in at the same rate, 24 percent, and that basically is the adult child or the family member who is uh, looking for uh, the facility or looking for care for their loved one, saying, I'm glad, I'm proud to be the person who has to take care of my mom or my grandma or my grandfather or my father, etc. in this situation. You can see the other topics there too, and it's really interesting when you get into the research to kind of dive down into those very granularly and see what you know, sort of third tier topics are driving those conversations, you can really sort of get into the mindset of the consumer in those particular situations. Real quickly here, before we kind of turn it over to questions, I wanted to focus on a couple of quick things. When people ask questions, we mentioned earlier about customer inquiry. So these are people raising their hand and asking questions on the social web. This chart particularly jumped out at me because if you look at the top three topics, uh, when people ask questions of the senior living space, they're asking questions about the legality of finances, which is a little different from a legal inquiry or finances separate from that, but the legality of finances. So the majority of those questions are basically people raising their hand and saying, can the facility in question come and take my home uh, if or make me remortgage my house if my mom can't pay for the, the care? That's the primary concern of the adult children is if mom can't pay for this or if dad can't pay for this, can you come after me? And that's a big question mark in consumers' mind, as you can see here, over 50% of the customer inquiry topics are about that. Now, legal inquiry is about half of that, and that's anything that's about 
you know, some sort of legal question about senior care that's not tied to finances. It might have something to do with maybe abuse claims or neglect claims. It might have, you know, some other ramifications, but it doesn't have something to do with finances. But then finances comes in as the third biggest topic. So from a marketing standpoint, especially a social media marketing standpoint, if I'm making a recommendation to you on content marketing, I'm going to say you need to put a lot of information out there that answers questions about legal and finance topics for your prospective customer because that's what they're looking for when they go to the web and ask these questions. One other uh, last little thing I wanted to share with you, when we index the audience that's talking about the senior care space online against the average internet user and what they talk about, and we look at it from an ethnicity standpoint, what you see here is that 74% of the audience online talking about the senior care space is Caucasian, 13% African American, so on and so forth. If you compare those percentages, to the average internet user. Now this is not the average US population, it's the average internet user who participates in conversations. The second number you see there out by those bars, like so if you're looking at Caucasian, 74% of the people who have conversations online about this topic are Caucasian. That 1.14 is an indice number compared to the average internet per person who has a conversation online. So what that says to me is, that uh, in the Caucasian community, the Caucasian community is 14% more likely to talk about the senior care space than they are the average topic. So they index high. African Americans, slightly above one, they index high. Asians, slightly below uh, one, so they index a little low. The big concern for me is the Hispanic number. And the reason that is is because Hispanics are not 2% of the U.S. population. They're getting close to about 15% of the U.S. population. So that index number at 28% or 0.28 is of great concern. What that tells me is, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, sort of imagine what the reasons are yet. I'm just saying that there is a large Hispanic population out there, and they are not talking about this topic at all. Now, that could be cultural. It could also have something to do with socioeconomic status, but it could also have something to do with the fact that maybe our industry is not targeting them and not talking to them for some reason or another. I don't want to imagine what those reasons are. I don't know the industry that well, but that number stands out as something I'm very concerned about when you look at the total population that's out there and know that that population is also aging. That could be an opportunity in the future it could also be a detriment to what we're doing now, so it's good to understand that. So I circle that big number in red there so that you can understand that a little bit better. Thank you so much, Jason. And you did touch on some recommendations while you were speaking, but I wonder if there's anything else that the senior living communities and in-home care agencies on the line um, can take away from this data immediately in their marketing and, for instance, differentiate against their competitors. So what recommendations do you have for them as next steps with both this data and conversation research in general? Sure. So with, with regard to the data that you've seen here, and certainly there's a lot more in the full report, um, those buyer journey uh, points, those five points that we talked about, I think there's ample opportunity for any brand in the senior care space to provide better content, more specific content to those journey points so that when consumers talk about it or when they go looking for it via search engines, they can find something that maybe your brand has provided, which gives you a touch point and an opportunity to introduce yourself to them. As a secondary point to that, but almost a more important one, even though it's secondary, um, I would you know try to invest less uh, invest less time and energy in branded social. So instead of spending a bunch of time on your Facebook page or on your Twitter account and the things that are your brand in those social networks, I think we need as an industry to start looking more at earned social and participating in other networks. So uh, for instance, a lot of conversations in this space happen uh, on forums and message boards uh, like um, there's there's plenty of them out there for whether it be uh, at caring.com, whether it be at you know some of the other uh, uh, 
uh, media outlets out there that sort of cover the space and talk about senior living and senior care uh, and just the senior lifestyle. There's lots of conversations happening there. Representatives of your brand and your company, in my, according to my research, are not there participating in those conversations with consumers. So waiting on consumers to come to you is probably not a great strategy since consumers are more apt and willing to go to an independent sort of third-party site and have these conversations and ask those questions. So I would invest less in branded social. I wouldn't ignore it, but I would invest less time and energy in, into it and more in going out and finding and participating in those conversations in relevant ways. And in terms of conversation research in general, understanding who is talking about you or the industry um, and who is looking for information uh, about senior care is going to be of benefit to you if you find some of these social listening tools or work with some research firms out there that can help you understand that space better, you're going to be able to find opportunities to talk to consumers who are raising their hand and wanting information. And you're probably also going to be able to build some nice relationships by helping answer those questions like the legal and financial concerns uh, that people have that right now it doesn't seem like any of your competitors are really doing. So the first you know, few folks out there doing it are probably going to see a good uptick in at least interest, if not revenue. Great. Uh, and then you also had a little special that you wanted to tell people about? Yeah. So the, the actual full research report is available on our website. I shortened the link for you. So it's bit.ly, bit, bit.ly slash senior care by. If you're interested in getting the conversation report on the senior living space, we've got an exclusive 50% off discount for all of you on the, the call today. You just use the discount code caring. Uh, and thanks to the caring.com network, you will get a 50% discount on the full research report for your organization. Wow, that's really generous of you, Jason. Thank you so much for extending that offer to everybody. Um, now we do have some questions, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward into the questions. Uh, here we go. Uh, just one moment, please. I'll pull those up for you. Okay, um, so we have a question about, did you see a lot of conversation around Alzheimer's, dementia, or memory care? Were those terms scanned for finding common? Yes. So we were able to surface a handful of conversations. Now, again, we looked very specifically at the buyer journey, so we weren't looking specifically for people talking about those particular um, you know, fields of care or topics of interest. However, there were several mentions. I would probably say less than 10%. Uh, I'm going from memory here, but I, I think less than 10% of the conversations we found mentioned a specific disease or a specific vertical of care. So what that tells me from sort of a third party looking at the data is that while there are a few people who are saying, I need to find a facility that has a, you know, a good uh, reputation for memory care or dealing with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or some specific disease. It's, it's not enough of the conversation in that buyer journey to stand out as something that's important to the consumer. Um, and that's just in the data that we looked at. It was data over the course of a year. I think if we went back and re-looked at the online conversation and looked specifically for uh, memory care, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, different diseases that are in that consideration set, we would certainly find a lot more conversation, but I don't think it would be focused on finding a facility that, that, that caters to that particular uh, niche. Now, that might be contrary to what you're hearing when people come to you and say, I'm looking for care for my mom, because again, this is, this is just looking at online conversations. So when people turn and talk about the fact that they're looking for a facility for care, they may leave out that disease. That may be, might be a little too personal for them to share in sort of a public forum online. So there could be lots of reasons why we didn't see a great volume of those particular conversations out there. Um, but and it, it, I'm not saying that that's not important when you're looking at the buyer journey or uh, how to talk to customers about what you provide, but at least it's not reflected in the online conversation in, in public conversations. 
Thank you. Um, you also, in your data, talked about in the negative conversation set that 34% were discussing alternatives to senior living or preference for alternatives to senior living. Um, was that specific to in-home care shopping or were there any additional insights that the in-home care agencies can take away, uh, non-medical in-home care, from the research that you did or that they could find in conversations online? The vast majority of that 34% were people simply saying, I would prefer to not put my parent or grandparent in a facility or a home. Um, so what I think that means for the in-home care segment is you've got an emotional trigger there that if you focus on, especially your messaging and whatnot, there is an active population out there that that is a primary concern of theirs. They would much rather, they're, now they're not specifically saying in online conversations, I would rather have in-home care. They're, at, they're actually saying, I would rather keep mom at home. I don't think they're talking specifically about the medical or even non-medical care. They're just simply saying, I don't want the expense or I don't want the, um, you know, sort of the, I think there's a, a a, a stereotype or a misnomer among consumers out there that not being able to care for a parent and putting them in the facility is somehow a failure on the family's part. And so I think that's the emotion that's being expressed there. But if I'm marketing an in-home care service, I'm going to try to seek out those consumers who say, I'd really rather not put my uh, parent in a facility because you can come in and say, well, maybe we can provide the in-home care that you need so you don't have to. Great. Okay, I have two additional questions for you. Um, one is, of the platforms you looked at, which one had the highest volume of conversations? And also, did you segment by geo and age? We um, did segment. Uh, we were not able to segment by age in this particular conversation. Um, age is one of those things that on social networks is uh, a little mysterious anyway. Um, you can get some of that information from the um, uh, from the internet service providers and whatnot, but that requires you know some sort of you know uh, a level of uh, of data purchasing and whatnot that we were not uh, able to commit to for this particular report. So uh, we don't break that down uh, by age group simply because the data is not easily to, easy to come by. We do break it down by gender. Uh, we also, uh, you know, certainly break everything down by conversation. I'm actually, as we're talking here, I'm kind of flipping through uh, the actual final report in front of me so that I can make sure that I'm not forgetting anything. Um, geographically, I don't think we did break that down. I do know that we, oh, we do break it down geographically. So the conversations uh, in the senior care space, I'll just sort of anecdotally tell you, do tend to mirror the higher population centers. So we do a look at the United States and, you know, New York, California, uh, Florida are, are more of the, the, the states in population, especially in the senior space, and those have higher volumes. But there's some interesting surprises out there. Oregon, Arizona, Wisconsin, Tennessee, Louisiana, um, even Massachusetts pop up as having a higher volume of conversation compared to uh, their population size compared to the rest of, uh, of the country. So we do break it down by ethnicity. We break it down by geography. We also compare the people who are talking um, about this particular topic online uh, to other things they talk about. So you'd be probably interested to know uh, that the people who have conversations about the senior care space online index very high for also having conversations about fashion of all things. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and then also uh, we only have a couple more minutes left so just one final question and anyone that didn't get their uh, question answered will follow up with you afterward. Um, but does the report have the have samples of specific conversations that you analyze to back up the data or is it strictly data? Um, we do have uh, some quotes and some highlights throughout um, in uh, the conversation uh, that sort of show examples of what people are saying out there. Um, and we also, you know, if anyone who purchases the report is interested, uh, we'd be hap happy to try to, you know, pull out some uh, anecdotes for you as well. And real quickly, one last thing, I, I think I missed a, a question uh, someone asked um, where the major which channel the, the majority of the conversations came from. 
our conversation sources, 83% of the conversation was on forums and message boards. So this was not happening on Twitter necessarily. It was not happening on other social networks, Instagram, things like that. This is forum. This is a topic that people want to have deep conversations about. So it's going to be somewhere where they can have a long threaded conversation that's organized. All right. I'm really sorry we have to cut short the rest of the Q&A. Uh, we have a couple more announcements that are important to folks, but let's just summarize quickly. Um, as Jason covered, senior care consumers are having conversations online that are rich with insights about your business. Conversation research should be included in your marketing toolkit, whether you do it in-house or leverage the software and consultants out there. And this, these insights, from online conversations can help improve the effectiveness of your sales and marketing if applied well. Um, so they can also, through content marketing, help you better attract and convert those prospects as Jason covered in multiple examples and that you can find in the full report and at his SMASH presentation as well. Um, speaking of which, we have Regina here who it has a special announcement to make for you. Regina, I've turned on the mic for you. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you to Jason for such an engaging uh, presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Jason will be our keynote presenter at the Senior Care Sales and Marketing Summit, uh, also known as the SMASH Conference, which is taking place this October 2nd through the 4th in Chicago. Uh, Jason will share even more insights into his study and social listening uh, for those of you who want to learn more about social listening. And in addition to Jason, we, the SMASH program features a host of speakers and experts who will share cutting-edge sales and marketing strategies to help the senior care industry uh, drive your census and occupancy. So we would love for you to join us at SMASH. And uh, as a thank you for being part of today's webinar, we are happy to offer a special discount as well. Um, and that is $400 off the current registration rate if you register by June 30th. So that's next Friday. And you can just use the code CARING400 upon registering to receive that discount. Um, and you can find out more about the sessions and speakers on our website, which is SeniorCareMarketingSummit.com. So thank you again, Jason, and thank you, Denise. Thanks, Regina. Do you also want to tell them about the next webinar we have planned with SMASH? Absolutely. Um, so we're very much looking forward to another conversation like today's. Uh, the next one will take place on July 27th, and that program features web website and SEO expert Andy Crestedina, who will share how to use content marketing to inspire website visitors to take action. So again, that takes place on Thursday, July 27th, and uh, we're very excited to be partnering with Caring.com once again. Thanks so much, Regina, and thanks for offering the discount to folks on registration for SMAC. I, I've heard lots of positive feedback about that conference in particular. Um, and everyone, I want to let you know you'll receive an invite for the next webinar in your inbox after the session, and it's on our blog, partners.caring.com. Um, speaking of which, here is how you contact us. So if you have any questions after the session, this is how you get in touch with me. I want to thank everyone very much for attending. We only went a couple minutes over this time. Uh, I want to thank Jason uh, very much. Jason Falls of the Conversation Research Institute for sharing his expertise and the insights with us today. And to Bailey Beacon, Regina, and the entire team at SMASH uh, for suggesting and co-organizing this session and the one in July, too. We hope you found the information helpful, and we really want your feedback. So at the end of the session, you're going to be prompted with an on-page survey. Uh, you'll also get a link to that survey after the session as well, or just send me an email, denise at caring.com. Let me know what you thought of the session. I also welcome your suggestions for topics you want us to cover in the future. Uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you to everyone who participated. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.